Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. Thank you, Anna. Welcome to a very special edition of AI for Good. I am Jennifer Woodard, an AI entrepreneur and co-founder of Insight Intelligence. And I am thrilled to be able to moderate an exciting session in which we will explore the impact that AI can have on the preservation and revitalization of indigenous languages. Now, this edition is special because it gets to the core of who we are as humans, what makes us human, our unique indigenous cultures and our languages. You know, it's easy to get caught up in technical conversations when we talk about things like machine learning, and large language models, and forget that what is at the very center of everything is our very human ability to communicate verbally. So this is why it's my pleasure to welcome Keone Mahelona and Peter Lucas Jones of Tejico Media, two trailblazers in the quest to leverage data and AI for the preservation of New Zealand's indigenous Maori language. Peter and Keone are not only using technology to advance an understanding of indigenous language and culture, but also to safeguard and maintain sovereignty over the community's data. Their presentation will explore many of these aspects and we'll have the chance to ask them questions about their project after the talk. So please stick around and join us for the networking session. Peter and Keone, it's my pleasure to welcome you to AI for Good. Kia ora. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, we're so happy to um, be part of this this evening. Thank you for the uh, introductions. Just before we get started, we wanted to both introduce ourselves. Called Peter Lucas Jones, tōku ingoa, kua o te kai whakahaere o te reo irirangi o te hiko o te ika. Tēnā koutou katoa. Aloha kako, Keone, ko ui noa no Hawaii ahau. I'm Keone, I'm from Hawaii, and I'm the CTO at Te Hiku Media. So I'm just going to uh, get started here. We're, we're both speaking tonight, and so I'll be um, piloting the slides, and uh, Pete will, will open us up. Well, kia ora. Um, we're going to be talking about accelerating um, the revitalization of Te Reo Māori with um, AI. Um, I'm the CEO of Te Hiku Media, Ke Oni, the CTO, and we have a data science project called Papareo, which is funded by um, the New Zealand government, by the Ministry of um, uh, Economic um, uh, Development and Innovation. Kia ora. We'll just go to the next slide. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of information about our organization. We started, um, or we, we uh, originally came about in 1990. Um, we're one of 21 um, tribal radio stations that were established um, uh, as part of uh, the Māori broadcasting movement. Our, um, our station or organization is uh, connected to the five tribes of the far north of Aotearoa, New Zealand, an area that's called Tehiku o Teika. <clears throat> Excuse me. And those tribes are Ngāti Kuri, Te Upauri, Ngāi Takoto, Te Rarawa, and Ngāti Kahu. I'm the chairman of Te Upauri, so um, I've got a very close connection with um, our organisation on that level as well. We're born out of um, a movement um, that was to recognize the rights and interests of our people. Um, and that is uh, 
with uh with, with with regard to claims that were put forward to the government for atrocities that were committed against our um, people uh, one of those things was language loss cultural decline and of course the way in which maori language was not um, part of the broadcasting uh, repertoire that um, our people were exposed to on a day-to-day -day, um, uh, day -day sort of um, uh, way. And so we were very much part of um, the dreams and aspirations of the native speakers of our tribe uh, in the uh, late 18, uh, 1980s. Um, they dreamt of having a radio station and that radio station was to broadcast news and information, um, not only um, uh, news information, but uh, to entertain in, in Te Reo Māori. Kia ora. Um, so uh, the Māori language claim, that's an integral part of um, uh, what we do. And whilst we're talking about um, uh, uh, you know, AI for good, it's really good for us to think about those people that played a uh, part in our past. And in Māori, we say titiro whakamuri, kia ngā whakamua. And from my perspective, that's very much about reflecting on where we've come from so that we can think about where we're going. Um, huirangi Waikere pu, uh, Puru and Ngā Kai Whakapumo were a group that lodged the Māori language claim. And that was really um, about seeing the rights of Māori language speakers and having our uh, Māori language recognised by the government. And today um, we uh, uh, see that Māori language is recognised as an official language of New Zealand. But for many years that wasn't the case and our grandparents and parents of course experienced um, having that language very much beaten out of their mouths as part of the education experience that they all um, uh, found themselves in for a time. And so we've, we're part of the um, broadcasting, um, the Māori Broadcasting Institution. As I mentioned, there's 21 stations that are iwi radio stations or tribal media hubs. There's also um, Whakata Māori that was otherwise known as Māori television. And so those um, collectively make, an eff uh, make a conscious effort to provide access to te reo Māori content. Um, kia ora. <clears throat> um, in 1990, um, Sir Graham Latama from Ngāti Kahu on behalf of the New Zealand Māori Council put forward um, uh, a claim for um, radio frequencies. And those are what we broadcast on today. And so the allocation of radio frequencies um, to the indigenous people of New Zealand uh, was a way in which uh, we could see the recognition and the protection of Maori interests in um, radio frequencies. And of course, now we see those being used in a range of different ways. And um, we're going to tell you the story of our station and our involvement in um, AI. Kia ora. So um, at the moment, there's a lot going on, particularly if we look back, there was a 3G, 4G, and now we're sort of talking about 5G. And when we talk about 5G in New Zealand, we're talking about our rights to radio spectrum as Māori. And you can learn more about that um, at that link there. Te Huarahi Tika Trust has just negotiated quite a substantial um, package um, that will see our, uh, our, our people, our tribal groups and Māori organisations have the opportunity to um, look at 5G from a way that they might be able to develop um, and innovate, but also to create economic opportunity. We went through a digital switchover, which was really, um, <clears throat> as a station, we had a regional TV uh, license as well. And um, as uh, an iwi station, we were the only people um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand that had um, a regional television station. That was a terrestrial based um, uh, project. And we <clears throat> went through what was the digital switchover. And so 
we started to move um, away from our terrestrial um, television broadcast and started to think how we might be able to uh, move into the digital realm. Um, there's currently a 4G and a 5G treaty claim. And um, that also, uh, how there were some allocations of funds um, as part of those negotiations that saw the development of a specific fund of $30 million that was set aside to um, grow Māori capability in the digital industry. We applied to that fund and uh, we applied to teach computers how to speak Māori, basically speech recognition research, um, text-to-speech for te reo Māori. <coughs> Kia ora. So our organisation, um, Te Reo Irirangi o Te Hiko o Te Ika, we have a vision and a mission like, um, or, or like all um, organisations. Ours um, was born out of hui with our community or meetings with our community. The specific um, uh, meeting was held at Mahi Maru Marae and He Reo Tukui Ho He Reo Ora. Living language transmitted intergenerationally is very much what was supported by the people from our community, from our five tribes that attended this strategic planning meeting, which was really important for us because it's not so much about what we want to do, but it was more about what was going to help our community, taking on board that the language loss and cultural decline that our people had experienced um, was having a very, very large impact on not only the way our families um, interacted with one another, but also our understanding of our identity. Our mission, whakatōkia poi poia kia matomato te reo Māori o ngā hau kāinga o te hiko o te ika, and still nurture and proliferate the Māori language unique to the hau kāinga. Hau kāinga are like villages of te hiko o te ika. Te hiko o te ika is the very far north from where we hail. Kia ora. So, as I mentioned, we've, um, we're, we started off as a radio station and we have 30 years of corpus gathering trust and accountability that we've grown and developed in the community that we not only um, belong to, but um, we serve. And so over that 30 years, uh, when we hark back to 1990, we spent many, many um, years uh, interviewing our elders, interviewing our elders about every river, every mountain, every plant, every beach, anything and everything that our elders wanted to talk about in our native tongue, te reo Māori, we would sit down and talk to them. And I think that we developed a style of getting people to talk naturally in a conversational style so it took a little, and that style um, uh, uh, helped us to uh, develop one of the largest archives of Māori language audio data uh, in the iwi radio network. Um, my, um, this photograph here is of my grandmother my, uh, and my two aunts, and um, the lady on the right, that's my grandmother, and the lady on the, um, uh, on the left, that is um, another grand aunt, but they were born in the 1890s. And they're some of the oldest of the people that were interviewed as part of our early interviews. Kia ora. And so we've come a long way understanding that radio broadcasting and terrestrial um, uh, broadcasting uh, is not the way that people consume content anymore. So in 2014, we developed our own digital platform. And as part of that process, we started to look closely at what um, sort of content our people uh, were absolutely um, interested in. And we started to reconnect with the community in a different way, live video streaming. Kia ora. And we live video stream events 
kapahaka or our traditional dance competitions are one of the things that absolutely bring in high engagement. I'm talking about um, groups of uh, schools or groups of adults that are competing, um, performing a range of different items. And uh, whilst these may not be broadcast um, on uh, mainstream television, through our platform, we've found that it's a way that we can not only serve our community by um, uh, providing content in our language, but it's also a way for us to increase the corpus that um, we uh, that, that that we archive uh, the corpus in Te Reo Māori, and that might range from singing to speech making to interviews, a large range of different forms of Te Reo Māori. <clears throat> Kia ora. And um, the next step for us was really developing an app um, that provided online access to all of our content. We'd gone from the radio to regional television to um, uh, our online platform, uh, providing, uh, con um, uh, providing access to um, all different types of content, regional news, um, information, entertainment, songs, music, um, also speech competitions, um, the dance competitions, kapahaka, but also funerals. So sometimes um, in our culture, uh, in Māori culture, um, our, our funeral ceremonies are quite elaborate and they go on for days. And um, depending on the status of somebody within our tribe, we may uh, broadcast um, the, 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 the funeral uh, and that might go for days and we receive visitors from other tribes and then there's a lot of speech making and, and singing. And we use these apps to provide um, access to all sorts of content. But I just wanted to mention that because it's important um, to remind ourselves that language is always about um, transmitting messages, about carrying a message. And in the cultural context of um, te reo Māori, we find that there are many different places that our language is spoken, but we were trying to connect many of our people that have moved away from our traditional areas as part of the urban migration, and of course, in search of work, for example, 86% of the members of my tribe do not live in our tribal area. So there was a lot of thinking that went on behind the development of our digital platforms as well, because what we wanted to see was a reconnecting of people with content access to language, because as we um, develop our language skills, we need to be able to mimic those um, colonization has seen a decrease in the number of speakers of our language. Sometimes that was uh, by way of uh, government policy. And um, more recently, we find that uh, we do not live in the communities that uh, naturally supported intergenerational transmission, um, like our parents or some of us might have grow had the opportunity to grow up in those environments, remember. So that's some of the thinking about uh, behind why we do what we do. Kia ora. Um, as part of the, um, the uh, speech to text project, we, um, we first started to think, how can we open up our archives? How can we make, um, give access to um, the stories of our elders that we've been interviewing for so long. And so we started to transcribe um, interviews and tag um, words and, and tag phrases and tag idiomatic expressions. Um, and so I just wanna play this for you um, briefly so that you get a, a, a look at what we were, were doing in, in that space before, and this is, um, yeah, just play that, uh, kia ora, thank you.
There's no um, audio, unfortunately. I can't hear anything. I don't have my. I'll just um, I'll just talk to it. So what we've got here is we have tagged um words, and what we've um done is we've also tagged phrases, and we've um these are idiomatic expressions and colloquialisms that are uh that have a meaning in the context of um, the different places uh, that um, the speakers of them uh, come from. And we wanted to take this opportunity with these native speakers of Te Reo Māori and capture this content so that second language learners um, would be able to uh, would be able to be exposed to these um, high quality examples of proficient speakers of idiomatic expression and colloquialism. Mm. Um, Sorry, I was muted. So you'll be, um, you'll be able to see that the um the explanations in Te Reo Māori change as um the text moves along and the speaker moves along. What I wanted to just share with you um quickly is we transcribed these by hand and to transcribe this um, level of speaker, um, you need to be pretty good at speaking the language and hearing the language and listening to the language. Unfortunately, we had way more interviews than we had people that were able to transcribe. So that really started our um, thinking about speech uh, to text. So we were thinking, how could we accelerate the way in which we could transcribe our archives, making them useful for learning purposes, making them useful for educational uh, purposes. For example, people might be able to do a project on it at school, or it might provide access to um, some information that a researcher might find very helpful uh, in the work that they do. Um, we decided that we wanted to teach computers how to speak Māori. And so um, we embarked on a project called Kōrero Māori because what we needed to do that was large quantities of uh, labelled data. Um, and so we started to look at how we were going to engage our community to offer the labelled data that we required to really get the ball rolling. Kia ora. Um, and, you know, we talked about revitalization, preservation, and the promotion of Te Reo Māori. Um, we've seen our language over the over the uh, the over the last uh, 180 years of colonization in New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, we've seen the language move to the brink of extinction. We've seen it move um, to a place where very few people um, experience intergenerational transmission of Te Reo Māori anymore. And the experience of learning Te Reo Māori has very much moved into an academic or learning or educational environment. And so we were looking at how we can make tools that would provide opportunity to use the language that they do have and provide an opportunity for people to feel safe uh, in the way that they might um, sometimes think that they haven't got it right, they might have some anxieties, particularly because as an Indigenous person, when you can't speak your language, there are feelings of inadequacy, and there are also feelings of um, needing to better understand um, one's, one's uh, or, or better develop one's understanding of their identity. And so we wanted to be, be part of a movement that is um, not only uh, developing tools that are useful for all speakers, but 
that could touch the hearts and the minds of the people that were part of our, um, closely part of our communities. We also wanted to create tech opportunities for Māori and Pacific Island people, knowing well that um, most tech um, organisations have either no Māori or Pacific Island people that work for them, or very few. Um, and so we wanted to create a way that spoke to the future about creating um, not just jobs, but populating those jobs with the people that came from our communities. And the other thing was, as I mentioned, we wanted to transcribe our native speaker archives to be of use to those um, people that are learning our language. And um, so we've used open source tools and we've um, coupled that with a very passionate community. And through that, we were able to um, develop a competition. Um, but before that, Keoni developed this, um, this platform and that was to capture the corpus, capture the label data. Kōrero means speak, whakaroro means listen. And so what we had was people reading um, sentences and um, it was very successful. Kimura. And um, in 10 days, we gathered 316 hours of labeled data. And I think it's really important for projects like this to be community led. And when you understand the community, um, and you come from the community and you're a member of the tribe. Um, and when many of um, the team are also closely connected in that way, there's a level of trust that the community have in you. Uh, and I think this was a clear example that our community supported us to do this piece of work. And over those 30 years that I talked about, we'd already developed trust and we'd developed um, a, 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 a really, really strong relationship with those people that we served in the broadcasting space. And they wanted to see us move and develop. And so when we started to uh, uh, focus on a lot of digital developments and when we started to think and uh, talk about natural language processing and talk about speech to text and text to speech and pronunciation modeling and all these types of things our people wanted to get behind it and they wanted to help and so this is uh, what we achieved in 10 days we have much more labeled data now but that was where we started and <clears throat> our um, a little bit of information about the corpus, um, the Fare Kōrero, which is the app that um, uh, Keoni brought up a little uh, uh, a few slides ago, that has um, three thousand five hundred hours of semi-labeled audio since uh, two thousand and fourteen, and um, that's in te reo Māori, some of it's bilingual. We label our, um, label our speakers. We also label which tribe they come from. We label the topics that they um, speak about because sometimes people might speak about two or three different topics. Um, and we also summarize it by giving it a bit of a, uh, an abstract because we're also focused on providing access to that content. So whilst we might be serving content to our users, we're also um, guardians of that data. And so for the last 30 years, we have been kaitiaki or guardians or protectors of the language that uh, we broadcast in Te Reo Māori. And we now have very much two different work streams that are closely intertwined. That's our iwi radio Māori language broadcasting arm, which is all about creating data. It's all about corpus gathering. And then our data science team that use that data to, um, to teach the computers what we need them to do. 
We also have our archives. We've got VHS tapes. Um, and the VHS tapes were how we would store data. We would store data um, on anything and everything because coming from a tribal community that didn't have access to a lot of the resources, we sometimes would think about how we could um, store as much data as possible. So we would um, record things in long form. We also um, had uh, 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 have quite a, a, a large film archive, um, and that includes, of course, interviews as well. Porero Māori, which I just talked about earlier, we have 550 utterances, uh, 550 hours of utterances now, which is a lot um, for us. And, and we're starting to now use that in a way that um, speaks to our natural language processing um, aspirations, including our natural language, under, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, hopes and aspirations for grammar checkers, spell checkers, all those sorts of things um, uh, for te reo Māori. Kia ora. So, um, Using our corpus for revitalization, I'm now going to hand it over to Keone because I've talked about how we've gathered data. Um, and when we talk about how we've gathered data, we've gathered data from native speakers of Te Reo Māori. And when you hear people speak Māori, you can often hear that intergenerational transmission of sound. Um, we often hear accents in English, and then we often... Um, hear different types of, um, uh, I guess, uh, different ways of speaking. We go, oh, okay, that person's not a native speaker of this language. Or sometimes a second language learner can really attain a native sound. But quite often uh, with te reo Māori, we hear the strong influence of te reo Pākehā. Um, one of those things is... Um, I, uh, 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 is the rise in intonation at the end of a sentence. And so what we hear is in English, uh, uh, often there's some sort of penultimate rise where uh, a statement can start to sound like a question. Uh, and now we are finding that that is starting to find its way uh, with second language speakers into te reo Māori, something that I, I um, have noticed, and we're wanting to look at how we speak native sound back into our future. And so we've been looking at the way in which our people uh, speak Māori and how they sound when they speak Māori. And that's an important part of the work that we do as well, restoring that native sound, um, because it's such an important part of our place and our uh, and our identity, and understanding too that as uh, people that had been colonised um, by others, um, and of course having language uh, loss and cultural decline and land loss and all our resources pretty much stolen from us, we understood the difference between natural evolution and uh, assimilation. So those are some of the background, that is some of the background to, to the work that we do. Kia ora. Oh, I'm still going. Or are you going to speak to this one, Kia ora? How is uh, you and then the kaitiaki tonga? <clears throat> okay. So Kia ora developed this pronunciation labeling uh, platform for us. I'm just going to ask Kia ora if we could, is it possible for us to play this one, Kia ora? Could we yeah, find another, this... uh, could, can we find another example? Well, we can try, but we have to review this one because we've done something uh -huh. just to speed yeah. up our uh -huh. internal work. So, uh -huh. Poo. So that's, that is, um, so poo is a word that means, um, it, it, it's like a bay. Um, it's like a, a bay in a little area, but it's also, um, uh, 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 in this sense, we'll mark that as correct because that person has pronounced it correct. So we can approve that. Poo. Taiwan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, so, we'll be in a can... loop there.
Are Tony? Aye, so the, this, um, this platform gives us the opportunity to um, mark up pronunciation. If pronunciation is correct, we can approve it. Uh, if it's incorrect, for example, this signals that there's a long sound on the U. Um, mm. so, and that is an example of um, correct pronunciation. If there was some noise mm. there, we might there's some noise. If it was incorrect, we'd mark it as kia kaha. If it was incorrect, but it still made sense, we can edit the sentence. And this is mm. how we um, develop our corpus for pronunciation modeling. Kia ora. Oui, oui. Um, so um, we will um, now talk about our Kaitiaki Tanga license. As I mentioned, we've been um, uh, uh, working in this area as an organization for over 30 years. So we're very much about upholding the Maori principles by which uh, we, were, um, we were taught. Uh, by our elders to act and um, to care for the content that we that we gathered, that we broadcasted, knowing that every time that we speak to somebody, and when you're interviewing um, a kaumātua or a kuia or one of our elders, it's an it's very different to interviewing a young person because our elders are always speaking into the future. They know that their mokopuna or their grandchildren are going to one day listen uh, to, to that content about a maunga, a mountain, or a moana, a specific um, ocean, or, 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 or whatever it is that they're focusing on. And we, 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 we take that idea and, and we're mindful that, that, that's, uh, that that's a focus area that has always been part of the work that we do. Uh, promoting the language, promoting the culture. And in so doing that, we know that our tikanga or our culture is also to build Māori capability um, and Māori capacity. And, and to ensure that we have, we maintain that accountability and that benefits from the work that we do, the data that we protect, the data that we're responsible for, that we uh, ensure that the fruits of our labor and the fruits of those that have uh, participated in these activities, the benefits from all that um, is re, uh, 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 is, uh, is, uh, it's put into the community. It's put into what matters. We're a charity. We're a Māori charity. And so we look at ways to maintain sovereignty because we, we know what it means to lose it. We know that data is the new land and having had our land taken from us and, and having had the experience of language loss in our families, we take um, data sovereignty very seriously. And those are just some very real examples. Um, and so we, we do prohibit um, uh, use of data, software, tools, et cetera, um, when we know that it's going to be used for bad, when we know that it's going to be used for the wrong purposes, when we know that it's going to be used in a way that things were used against our own people, um, when we think about how uh, the last 180 years has uh, unfolded. And whilst we're reclaiming and uh, re-emerging now and reimagining our future, we're very mindful of our past. And so our approach is one of affirmative action uh, for data, software, and the way in which we develop digitally. So that's a little bit of background without getting into the hard out detail about kaitiaki tanga um, and data licensing, but tiaki means to care. Tiaki means to uh, protect. 
tiaki means to look after something. And so uh, that's what we do. And that's my job. I'm the kaitiaki rarauna. And uh, that's a job that we all participate in as a team, protecting our data and making sure it's uh, used for good. Because there's not a lot of machine learning or, uh, or any of that sort of stuff without access to the data. So we guard that and we monitor its use very carefully. We get a lot of requests. Sometimes we say yes, but other times uh, we do have to say no. Kia ora, I think it's your turn. Yeah, kia ora. Thanks, Pete. Um, yes, yeah, so just in case some of you aren't familiar with sort of the whole indigenous data sovereignty movement or what it actually means, I just wanted to go over um, briefly some some examples and sort of why it is that we we talk about it and why it's important. Um, excuse me. So when we talk about digital sovereignty, we're really talking about maintaining sovereignty and the guardianship over our platforms, over our data, pretty much everything that's digital. Um, as Pete alluded to, we've you know lost our sovereignty for a lot of the land that we used to look after uh, pre-colonization, and we want to ensure that our cultural knowledge that our languages, that our communities, our digital communities um, aren't, aren't sort of damaged in the same way that colonization has damaged us prior. Um, and so we're really strong proponents of ensuring that we do have sovereignty. Um, and I think with the way technology is going, it's, it's really easy these days to spin up a digital platform. So maybe back in the day, you had to rely on YouTube, but um, with a bit of technical expertise, um, you could probably build your own sort of YouTube replacement um, if you didn't trust your indigenous data being in a platform uh, like YouTube. The other key thing is is creating opportunities for indigenous people. I mean, everyone's aware of the inequalities in STEM. We want we need more women in STEM. We need more BIPOC in STEM. Um, and so, you know, this is one way in which we can do that is to actually create opportunities that are enticing and relevant to indigenous people. Um, there's a bit of a catch as well, and is that, you know, if we want our indigenous languages and our cultures to survive, they need to exist in the digital domain. Now, the, the catch or the challenge is when um, the digital domain is um, dominated by a select few companies, as we see, you know, with the big five coming out of um, uh, mainly the U.S., uh, social media being predominantly dominated by Meta. Um, and it's, it kind of, it, it makes it challenging because it says that if, if we want our languages or our cultures to exist digitally, that means they have to exist in these dominating platforms. They have to exist in Facebook and TikTok, et cetera. Um, and, and that also means that our languages and our culture, our stories also have to exist uh, among the things that we're seeing in, in social media today, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of racism uh, we're seeing live streaming of uh, things that shouldn't be live streamed. And for us uh, as Indigenous people, certainly us as an organization, we don't want the stories like you saw Auntie Lenny earlier. We don't want to put Auntie Len Auntie's Lenny's um, story in a platform that will also show sort of racist things and other things that undermine the mana um, of, of the content um, that we share. And finally, we want to promote our languages and our culture from our own worldview, from, from the way that we see it. And that is the best way to tell the stories of, of, of our people. Um, if we were to give corporates access to our data, and this is just as history uh, dictates, they will definitely profit from it. And we'll have the privilege of using their products and services. And, and we've seen this before, and we're even seeing it today in terms of um, corporates or tech companies trying to sort of help um, or save uh, indigenous groups. The other thing is uh, open source. Now, open source is great. We use a lot of open source uh, internally at Teiku. Uh, we, we contribute back to the open source community as well. But sometimes open doesn't work uh, for indigenous data or for indigenous tools. And the simplest example I can give that I think most people would understand is the tragedy of the commons. Um, Another more uh, appropriate example is, is one of privilege. Um, not many indigenous people uh, had the luxury of going to MIT or you know, getting a really good education. Um, some don't even have internet or a laptop. And they wouldn't even know what GitHub is. 
So this is sort of the discrepancy in, in you know, between indigenous people and non-indigenous people. So if we put our things in the open, open source or we put it into GitHub, it's very unlikely that our own people will have the tools to access uh, that data. And this is why we mentioned affirmative action before in terms of a Kaitiakitanga license. Um, with the tools that we've developed, the speech tools we've developed, more non-Maori are coming to us for access to our tools rather than Maori. And we're not surprised about that, but we wanna change that. We want more Maori to be innovating and building you know, digital apps and things like that. And so in terms of access to our API, we wanna give preference to young up and coming Maori developers um, to access our tools before some big company that has all the resources in the world um, uh, accesses our tools. Um, and then I mentioned the national park example, uh, which is sort of a common one where things are taken from us and, and then sort of told, we're told that um, we weren't necessarily good stewards of those resources and that some other body, some non-indigenous body is a better steward of something that was once um, being stewarded by, by indigenous groups. Um, I like to talk about sort of big tech colonialism and, and imperialism. And I mentioned this early in terms of dominating platforms. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that it's just Android or iOS. Like we have two things to choose from in terms of the uh, mobile phones. Um, that's not totally true. There's, there's Linux and a few other ones. Um, uh, likewise with social media. Um, and then you have companies like Apple sort of using its privacy um, as a way to maintain its walled garden. And, you know, we're seeing some things in the EU, which is great to sort of break up um, uh, some of these ma monopolistic um, uh, ways of doing business. Um, things like in-app uh, and default browsers are, I see a form of imperialism or, or call it colonialism, where you're forced to use uh, a certain search engine and you have to manually go in and change that you're forced to use a certain browser, certain certain things not working uh, in other browsers. Um, being, you know, the options to sign in with are often like, you know, Apple or Google um, or Facebook. So again, it just shows the dominance of these tech companies in, in the digital domain, which I think is something we need to, to improve on. Um, in terms of like indigenous uh, uh, languages having a space in the digital domain, so that there is the puny code for our um, fadekorero.nz domain. So there's a, a macron O between the K and the R, and that's sort of what it looks like in puny code. Um, so on Twitter, Twitter doesn't support our macrons. So when we share fadekorero.nz on Twitter, um, it gets converted into this puny code, and that's what you see, which isn't ideal. Um, but that's you know one of the things you face as a as a language with uh, characters that aren't I guess common to to your Western languages. Um, also, uh, Google Docs uh, says our URL is an invalid URL. So yeah, another little technical glitch that needs to be fixed. Um, and then you have companies sort of uh, you know soliciting us for our data. Uh, you have cultural appropriation. And these are a few examples that I wanted to point out. Um, here's one from Duolingo, and they say that more people are learning Irish on Duolingo than there are native Irish speakers. And you can understand why Duolingo might want to say that. And, you know, it kind of celebrates them in terms of what they're doing to help with the revitalization of the language. But if you put yourselves in the shoes of the native speaking community who've worked for decades, who've, you know, fought for uh, independence, um, and who have fought to keep their languages alive, um, that is not a very nice thing to say, and, and it's quite insulting. It's kind of demeaning or undermining, you know, the work from the native speaker community. Um, yeah, so that's that's a that's a no no. Um, Aloha poke. Uh, poke is is the word in Hawaiian. Poke literally means to like cut up into cubes, and hence the the raw fish is cut into cubes, and that's that's the. Um, the background of the word, but they sent cease and desist letters uh, to native Hawaiians who had restaurants with uh, poke uh, restaurants with the word aloha in it. Um, they got a lot of flack and I think have since stopped sending them, but that's sort of an example of digital or, uh, you know, colonialism. Um, I think, I think Disney speaks for itself. Uh, Lionbridge was, uh, soliciting um, indigenous communities to speak uh, their language. Um, they were offering $45 US an hour 
uh, your job was to just read sentences in say Hawaiian or Maori um, and then record those and then you would give it to Lionbridge. Um, and we were never sure sort of why or who was 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 sort of bankrolling this or why they would do it. And we actually, we didn't, we didn't like it because we've, we've seen these things before. Um, and it's a way of sort of like, you know, paying, I mean, ch not much money. I mean, $45 is a lot for um, a Hawaiian actually, who's, who's working three jobs, just struggling to stay afloat in Hawaii where the cost of living is so high. Um, so yeah, a Hawaiian might sort of take the $45 and give a little bit of their language away. But what in turn are they actually giving away? And what could Lionbridge use with that Hawaiian language data down the future? And could they possibly profit off of it? And would any of those profits actually make it back to the Hawaiian communities? Um, further on the Hawaiian language, uh, you know, in the 1920s, there was a lot of propaganda uh, in Hawaii um, saying to speak American, uh, you know, we're uh, very many cultures, Hawaiian, Chinese, um, Japanese, Portuguese, Germans, uh, Filipino, uh, and, and English as well. Um, and, you know, they, there was this propaganda to get everyone to speak, to speak English. Um, and as Pete said, it, what happened in Aotearoa, which also happened in Hawaii and, and many other uh, places throughout the world, is our languages were literally beaten out of our ancestors. Uh, they were outlawed in some cases. Uh, you, were spat, you were slapped in school if you spoke it. Um, and so that's the history. You know, that's where we come from. Uh, and then you have um, Duolingual who now offers Hawaiian in, the, in their, their platform, which is good. Um, and there were Hawaiians who decided that this should happen. Um, but they are, they are saying it is the best way to learn Hawaiian. And you know, they don't really mean that this is literally some code, like a template string somewhere, right? Where you say insert language here. Um, and it's just, it's probably part of some automated deployment. It's definitely not like the world's best way um, to learn Hawaiian. But, but the thing here is that like, if you subscribe to Duolingo, say $200 a month, I mean a year, um, they, they can profit off of you learning um, Hawaiian. And, and I challenge them and say, do any of those profits flow back to the language communities in Hawaii who are still working to revitalize the Hawaiian language? And the answer to that is no, but I do challenge Duolingo to think of a new way in which you can, if you do have access to indigenous data, how can you actually help the indigenous communities from which the data was taken? Um, and in the example here, we have Google Translate. <clears throat> and this is just an example of Google Translate just being wrong in terms of the translation here. It says, Kia kaha wahine ma, uh, which is saying, be strong, um, uh, women, like women be strong. Um, uh, but Google thinks it says, let white women be strong. Ma also uh, means white in Te Reo Māori. And you can kind of play with it and get some interesting um, translations. Now, Google doesn't, clearly they don't care about putting out these sorts of, you know, machine learning models, meaning models that maybe aren't accurate all the time or don't do the, you know, don't maintain the integrity of the language. But for us as an organization whose mission is, you know, the revitalization and the intergenerational transmission, trans, transmission of Te Reo Māori, we absolutely need to maintain the integrity of the reo, ensure that everything we um, produce and release um, is, is grammatically correct, um, you know, pronunciation is correct, and do our best to not further harm the language because of colonization. Um, how am I doing on time? <clears throat> uh, I, I do want to mention the terms and conditions, um, and that obviously you should read them, and, and we do. Uh, sometimes maybe we don't read them as much as we should. Uh, what I have here on the right is some of Google's terms and conditions, which I think are actually really good because they're very upfront about um, what they're going to do uh, with your data. And, and one interesting one here is that they can modify and create derivative works of, of your data if you put it into um, some of their platforms where, you know, you're, I mean, you're using it for free, but it's not really free, right? You're trading, you're trading your data um, for access uh, to their services. Um, and then we and we talk about language as a service, and this sort of kind of takes us to to what we're working on um, today, and and what we're using uh, machine learning for. Um, it's I mean it's you know it's no surprise that you can access many languages on Google's platform AWS and Azure. Um, 
and which is good. And then it's a lot, you know, it's enabled all sorts of amazing technologies uh, today. Eventually, you know, where the question is going to come as to whether indigenous languages should also be a, uh, accessible in these platforms. You know, can I pay whatever, 10 cents um, uh, an hour or something to, to transcribe Te Reo Māori using Google? Um, now, we're of the position that no, you shouldn't. And the reason is because it would mean that Google would be profiting from the indigenous language, from Te Reo Māori. Um, and considering again, the history of indigenous languages um, being forced to extinction in some cases and near extinction in others, um, why should we allow non, a non-indigenous group to profit from our indigenous language? It, it really just doesn't make any sense. So we want a better future for AI, for machine learning. Um, and rather than you know, what we're seeing, which is sort of big tech providing us with you know, absolutely every service we can imagine, um, we think that we should empower the communities to lead their own platforms and solutions and so that they can work together and help to move their people uh, forward. And, and I think Tahiku is a, a really good example of, of that. You know, we're a community organization. We're not, you know, we're about 30 people now. Um, we're not very big, we're a nonprofit. And we've shown that actually in today's day and age with the technology available, with the right skill set, you can actually do some impactful things and you don't need to be saved by some big outsider who's got like a lot of money. So, so far what we have achieved with um, our machine learning initiatives, we've got pretty fast uh, Te Reo Māori speech recognition. Um, it's, it's, a, it's based off of deep speech uh, Mozilla's deep speech. Um, we've quantized the model, which means that it can run, uh, it's it's like 10 megabytes in size. This is the acoustic model. Um, and it can run on uh, an iPad Air 2 from like 2014 or something. Uh, it can run on a, on a cheap computer and it runs pretty darn fast. Um, we also have a real-time pronunciation uh, model uh, that uses our, it sort of uses our speech recognition and does some other clever stuff that also runs uh, on device, um, on a, a CPU. We've been working on parts of speech and we, we've built an automatic part of speech tagger. Part of speech is, is sort of a foundational um, uh, linguistic uh, thing that, you, that, that you, you might need if you wanna do things like natural language understanding, uh, grammar um, and things like that. So it, it is a foundational piece of uh, work that is required for some of the future language processing initiatives we have. Um, we've just recently uh, launched our new Te Reo Māori speech synth synthesizer. We built one a few years ago. It was incredibly slow. It was based on Tacotron too. It required a GPU uh, to run. Uh, we um, used something called Fast Pitch, which I think was developed by NVIDIA. Um, and, and we've quantized this model as well, which means it can run on a CPU at, at pretty good speeds, um, but we engineered some tricks uh, to make it appear to run uh, much faster. And of course, the most important achievement is actually our Kaitiakitanga license. It's not the tools that we're building, it's how we're looking after the data and the tools uh, that we're building. And, and that has been picked up um, um, by a number of, a number of people. I just want to show uh, our our supercomputer. Uh, this is uh, an NVIDIA. Um, it's uh, what is it? A G DGX board uh, with four A100s, uh, 80 gigabytes each. I think it's only got like a 64 CPU in there. But yeah, this is what we use now. It's in Kaitaia, like in the far north here in Aotearoa, in a town you would never. You come to this town, you would never imagine. Um, like this machine is here and the sort of the, the, the models that it's, um, it's training um, in context is like on the bottom there, this black thing is like a 2012 uh, HP Microsoft Windows server. So the new GPU is much uh, smaller, much louder though. It sounds like a, a jet engine when you start it up. Um, and yeah, our story has been picked up by sort of some of the mainstream media. Uh, Wired did a, a good article about our work in fact, a lot of people in here at Aotearoa only heard about us after uh, Wired did the article, which is interesting. Um, there's a really good four-part series in MIT Tech Review. I do encourage people to read it, um, sort of talking about AI. 
um, and how it can be used for bad and, and how it can be used for good. Um, I definitely recommend it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone here is interested in AI, AI knows of, of Timit Gibru and the great work that she's sort of exposed coming out of Google. Um, and yeah, she's a bit of a fan of ours as well, which, which is nice. Um, so what's happening with, with these tools that we've built? Um, in terms of our Maori speech recognition, there's this uh, uh, Maori company here, uh, Reo Ora, where this is like an online uh, Maori language learning tool. And they're using our speech recognition to help with assessment of their students uh, when they have to read phrases to practice their deal. So rather than it, like, it's, you know, it's one man who's he got a website which helps him scale, but he obviously can't like review all of his students doing things like saying kia ora or he pehe ana koe. Um, so if you can use a machine model uh, to help with some of these more mundane assessments, then you can actually focus your time on, on the more interesting sort of assessments or the more challenging ones. <clears throat> and we've built a tool called Kaituhi, and I'm just going to show it here. Um, so Kaituhi is it's a transcription uh, tool where you upload some audio. Um, it sort of breaks it into uh, chunks, if you will. Um, if you think about like captions and subtitling, and um, we also, and when we when we upload audio to here, we automatically transcribe it using our speech recognition API. Um, and yeah, it's about an hour, so I won't I won't show that, but I do just want to show like some of the tooling that we have here. So what you see here in red uh, and not red is just us labeling the different language. So I think I can just play this. January the 13th, 1988. The English. And I have with me into courtroom, the Reverend Maori Martin. A few Maori uh, words in English. And now he's speaking in Maori. So what we've, with this app, what we're doing here is just being able to label uh, multi bilingual speech here so that we can do our next thing, which is train a bilingual speech recognition model. Because currently our speech recognition only detects uh, te reo Māori. It will ignore uh, some English or it might trans uh, attempt to transcribe uh, some of the English. And for languages like uh, te reo Māori where, you know, there's a history of colonization in Aotearoa, um, there's a lot of bilingual or, or code switching. If you want uh, speech tools that are practical and can be used day to day by everybody, they absolutely have to be bilingual. Um, so that is sort of like a key focus for us is actually building uh, bilingual recognition uh, and bilingual synthesis. Um, and we've just released a couple of weeks ago this app. You can go and download if you want. Rungo.app is the website. It uses our machine learning model to detect uh, or, or, or sort of uh, assess your Te Reo Māori uh, pronunciation. It is a oral uh, experience, so there's no text. It's very much um, a kayako where a teacher will say a phrase and you have to repeat the phrase back to the teacher. And our model will assess how you pronounced that phrase. It'll detect which words you may have stumbled upon and it'll ask you uh, to reread those words and practice them and sort of drill you down and then get you to repeat the phrase again. Um, and so this is one way in which we're using machine learning to help people with correct pronunciation of the language. There's learning the language and then there's like speaking it uh, correctly. And so this is just focused on uh, pronunciation. Um, yeah, what we hope to achieve with machine learning is to bring back the native sound and Pete alluded to this earlier, the sound that would have been lost through colonization, through the influence of the English language. We can hear uh, the English vowels creeping into some Maori words. Um, a common one is like, instead of mihi, you might hear mihi. Instead of rangatira, you might hear rangatira. So that's that shorter i sound coming from English. And so we wanna remove that. Uh, and we're hoping an app like this and machine learning tools can help us to detect those uh, mistakes at scale and correct them at scale. Uh, finally, we um, this all sort of comes together into our Papareo API. So I mentioned sort of language as a service and these cloud services before. Um, so we're uh, nearly ready uh, to launch um, our Papareo API, um, which would provide four foundational uh, uh, 
um, or sorry, three foundational speech tools for Te Reo Māori. So that's speech recognition, uh, speech synthesis, and um, pronunciation. These can all be run on device, um, or in this case, you can access them through um, uh, through our website. And I just want to show you here our synthesis and give you a demo, and you may have you may recognize this voice. Um, so just to show you that it's not staged, I've got a lot of text here. Um, and we're going to see how long it takes to transcribe or to synthesize that. Kua mutu te kura mō taku tau tuatahi. Kua whakaritea e pāpā he mahi waihanga whare mamao. Ko te mahi nei he hono atu i te tahi atu rumaki te rumahi. So, um... We had a look in to try and figure out what we thought uh, Amazon uh, does because they have a, a crazy fast uh, speech synthesizer. It's not as fast as what Amazon uh, Polly does, um, but we managed to do it. So yeah, there's some engineering uh, sorcery that happens on the back end, um, and we stream the the synthesis back to the end user as the rest of the text is being synthesized. So we can do that because our synthesizer works a little faster than real time, but not like super fast. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a hack to kind of build an API that's actually useful. Um, uh, yeah. And I think I think that's it. Here is a little link um, to uh, some resources, uh, links to some of the articles I mentioned and some some other articles on like indigenous uh, data sovereignty and Maori data, data sovereignty if you're uh, interested. And yeah, I think I think that's us. Thank you so much, Keone and Peter, for the enlightening walk through the work of Tehiko and the advances you've made with AI for the benefit of the Maori language. It's passion. It's definitely a labor of love. It's the perfect combination of, of AI and and just a real passion for your, your history and your culture. It's very, very inspiring. So at this point, what we want to do is open up the floor for questions, uh, for uh, questions for Peter and Keone from the audience. If anyone has any questions, you can put them into the chat function and also uh, hang around for networking uh, after that. Um, the first question I have is from Reinhardt. Um, he is asking, what are the top three lessons you've learned from this 30 year journey? that other indigenous peoples could potentially benefit from for rescuing their languages. Uh, he says, he supposes that maybe collecting audio and video data is priority number one, or are there other priorities or other lessons that you, that they could potentially benefit from? Well, I don't know if there's a top three, but I can just speak to three. <laughs> um, one, one of the things is to always attend um, your tribal gatherings. Always attend your tribal gatherings because if you don't walk with the people, uh, it's hard for them to know who you are. Always, so we, the um, uh, marae is really important in our community, which are kind of our meeting houses or meeting places where events um, happen, whether they're happy or sad events. And it's really important to participate in those. And so that's an important part of our work is being seen in those places and being heard in those places and also broadcasting from those places. That would be the um, one, one thing. Another thing is to keep connected intergenerationally. Whilst we hear about the youth all the time, all young people will want, uh, want uh, well, we hope that they will make old bones. So we like to connect our old people with our young people and our young people with our old people. And we make space and time to, to make that happen. I think Keone will have a couple of ideas as well. I mean, I would also say that keep, keep broadcasting content from your people that's really important to tell the stories, not just internally, but there are some stories that belong externally. For example, speaking to strategic uh, opportunities, like how we're talking to one another, tell the story, let it be known. 
Yoni, did you have something to add? Well, that was three, so not really. Um, but, <laughs> but just to uh, you know, what support what Pete said, I, I saw a few months ago um, a group of indigenous tribes in Central America recently launched a radio station. So, it you know, radio is still relevant today, um, and it, it is a good opportunity to reach your people in in your indigenous language. And if you're doing that, it's a great way to you know to funnel in content that you can then use um, for language resources down the future. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely not like go and collect audio, but that, you know, that is important. Like tell the stories, you know, tell the stories of your people or get your people to tell this, the stories of, of, of your people and make sure that's, that's captured somewhere for future generations. Mm -hmm. And building off that, I actually wanted to ask you guys, do you think that this project would have been uh, possible without the existence of Maori radio, uh, the 30 year trajectory that you have of kind of this sort of digital audio archive? I think people have always dreamed the dream of making it happening and um, making it happen. But um, without the data, there's really little that anyone can do. So it was like a match made in heaven for us. And so much as that we had been collecting the data and then we built a team of passionate people, passionate um, people that not only care about machine learning and artificial intelligence, but care about what we're trying to achieve. And I mm -hmm. think once we had um, all those moving parts together, we started to really see some, some positive movement forward and also breathing life into the team members. And, and, and really, I would like to congratulate everybody that's been part of this journey because it certainly hasn't just been me and Keone. There have been, it's been an intergenerational effort. Um, and it's also been, we've seen some of our own members of our own tribe relocate back into our tribal area um, from an urban experience. And, and that too, I think, speaks to how these sorts of projects can reconnect people on many different levels. Yeah, absolutely. And actually speaking to that, I had a question about that reconnection. For instance, this project, you were saying there's a lot of importance of, you know, kind of being physically in the, in the space, right? Being able to interact with the community so they trust you. Um, but then there's this other aspect of extending all of this knowledge, the pronunciation knowledge, the cultural knowledge, the cultural memory of your people to other generations. And I was wondering about the diaspora. So are there Maori outside of New Zealand or outside of tribal areas that are accessing this type of uh, content? Are they interested? Uh, can you see any impact or maybe is that a future extension of the project? Um, well, 86% of the members of our iwi or our, um, our, our, uh, in our tribal area um, live outside of our traditional area. Mm -hmm. So in some level that, that is a diaspora, but they're um, in urban centers. Um, most of the people that don't live in Aotearoa, New Zealand, live in Australia, and they certainly do consume the content. But we're mindful that when, um, we're, when people live in different circumstances and in different places, they do get homesick and they do yearn for that connectedness. And so we're mindful that people come to our, um, our, our platforms for that. And we manage to keep on average people on our platforms for seven and a half minutes, wow. which is pretty flat out. So people come to us with purpose. Um, and we have a team of um, young Maori women that work on our broadcasting content, developing what it's going to be focused on, the purpose of the story, and then how we tell the story. And we tell it in such a way that speaks to um, people's interests. And, and seven and a half minutes is a long time for us. Very good. Um, I have another question from the audience. Uh, the question is uh, maybe for you, Keone, um, how has your work uh, or has your work encouraged young Maori people to get interested in computer engineering or data science? Um, 
That's a, I hope so. Um, we, we've certainly uh, created opportunities for younger uh, people, uh, students, Maori students, for example, in university. We've uh, had some uh, summer positions uh, for them where they could work in uh, data science or work on, on some of the things uh, that we do. Um, yeah, we and I do remember one time um, we were doing a live stream and something was broken. So we're like live streaming over there and I'm like laying on the ground, like writing code, fixing something. And there were these two young uh, Maori kids and they were like looking at me and like, oh, he's writing code. Wow, that's so cool. And so it's like, oh, that's cool. Like clearly they know about code and, and like, you know, that you write it and, and also thought it was cool. So I think, I think the education system is doing something good. Um, I think we could do more certainly for the, the younger uh, people, but because of sort of where we're at, we, we are looking at creating job, like jobs for people who might've already um, gotten uh, the education. And also hope, hopefully a lot of our staff, you know, we've hired um, four, four Maori recently, um, data scientists and developers, like hopefully they can be mentors, right. In their communities. Cause when you think about like tech people, it's, you know, the same sort of thing that we know, right? It's always a, a certain type of uh, um, demographic, right? And so having more um, Maori and Pacifica people as mo uh, role models for, for kids is definitely like, the, I think a good first step. Excellent. Um, I wanted to ask you, speaking about tech people and big tech, some of the topics that we touched on before, um, I know that a project like this is very ambitious and it's probably hard to scale both technically and scientifically uh, with limited resources. Um, has there ever been any temptation to actually partner with tech companies in order to kind of get it to a place where you want it quicker, let's say? You mean like because we want to achieve something faster? Right, uh, to accelerate yeah. basically the, the goals of the project, let's say. Um, look, when we first started, we didn't have the internal, like we didn't have any data scientists. So we did uh, work with um, an organization in New Zealand called Dragonfly. Um, and they sort of, they were like a subcontractor and they sort of helped with some of the initial um, machine learning or data science work. Um, but as we sort of grew, we, we saw a real opportunity to grow internally our own capability um, uh, to really just focus on te reo. Because one thing about when you sort of outsource, uh, you know, or you get some contractors, not only are they working on like your project, right? They're working on these other projects and, and their staff or the data scientists might not necessarily be as passionate about the language uh, or care for the data as much as, as some of the people that sort of suit, you know, an organization uh, like ours. Um, and uh, with our Fare Kōrero app, you know, that was one where we just needed to get it out. And so we didn't build that internally. We did hire, um, you know, a company to help us build it. Um, I mean, it was all of sort of our ideas and we built the back end, but they pretty much, you know, did the apps because we didn't have any app developers. Um, but we're, you know, we're wanting to build that sort of capability. So with the Rongo app, which I showed you, that was done 100% uh, in-house and and the team are just like super proud of it like we're really proud of the work that we've done we've been getting really great reviews on it I actually I think it's pretty game-changing in terms of what the future could like look like for language learning apps because it is an audio only uh, way to um, to you know to learn a language um, and then in terms of like would we ever partner with sort of big tech to try and get things out the door faster um, or, or maybe to achieve some of our missions. I think eventually, um, you know, we talked about the ubiquity of, of our indigenous languages, right? And at some stage, you know, Siri is gonna have to know some of these indigenous languages and, and so will Alexa and Google and Cortana and whoever else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, those days might be inevitable or, or, um, you know, someone like the EU, uh, you know, does some things where rather than uh, you, you being required to use, say, Apple's speech engines to run Siri, maybe you can plug in your own speech engine, right? Um, and then Siri can use your own speech engine. So if Apple does something like that, it means that somebody else could perhaps provide the indigenous language tools, 
you know, for Android or for iOS, and it doesn't necessarily need to come from Google or, or Apple. So I think there are ways to work around it, but it's, you know, and I mean, us here in the far north of Aotearoa, I don't think we have much influence. Um, but when I look and see like the things coming out of the EU, I, I, I see hope uh, um, uh, for the future. And, and I would, you know, if we could help be a part of that or guide that or share some ideas that, you know, we'd be more than happy to, um, to help with that because, uh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's, for example, with Google, if, if Google were to um, be able to provide, uh, say, Maori through, you know, the Android system, it also means that it's going to be available as a service in Google Cloud because that's sort of how they operate. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't we don't necessarily think that's best uh, uh, for 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 uh, certain indigenous languages unless you can work out some sort of like royalty sort of a system or some way that if they are generating profits from indigenous data, that somehow a portion of the, of those profits make it back to those indigenous communities. And then it has to happen. I mean, like look at Hawaii, right? We've got, I mean, you got Hawaiians living in tents. They just cannot afford to live there. They're living in tents and they're working two jobs. Right. And so that's the state of, today's society with, you know, with all the wealth uh, in the world and all the amazing technology and all this great artificial intelligence, we're still failing at some very basic uh, human rights, right? And, and, and as you know, in that opening video that we had here tonight, it was great. It was, it was motivating, right? In terms of like, you know, the, like recognizing that there are problems out there and, you know, perhaps we can, can solve them. And so let's solve them. Absolutely. And that's why we're here to talk about it here today. It's, a, it's an excellent example. So basically, in terms of partnering with technology companies, it would be that the technology companies would actually need to contribute something back to the communities in order to kind of uh, make that worth worth your while. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask, um, uh, Peter, you talked about the conversational style of capturing uh, these types of uh, pieces of data, all the utterances, and there's massive, it sounds like you have massive amounts of, of data. And I wanted to ask you, uh, or both of you actually, if, if it's something that's really hard to structure, um, how can you go back and go back into this data and be able to pull it back up in order to build the models that you're building? Is, is that a challenge or, or has it been something that you've been able to kind of cope with over the years, working on the project for, for quite a while? Well, I think uh, when you conduct the interviews and you understand the data so well, you know how to make sense of it in different contexts. And we use the data for so many different things. We understand the data so well because we've been part of its development. And quite often we're either the interviewer or the interviewee um, because we're or, or, or we're program directing or we're organizing some part of it so we understand the, the talent. And I think understanding the talent's really important, not just for the purpose of gathering data, but understanding what makes them tick, because essentially what we want them to do is talk. We want them to tell a story. So we invest time in understanding what it is that interests them. And, and, and so we get people to talk about what's meaningful to them. And we, um, we, we, we don't just talk to somebody once. We might spend a lot of time uh, having a series of interviews until you build the confidence of a speaker to really share a story in such a way that's not just entertaining, but it's actually captivating. And so we have all different forms of stories that we've collected from just one speaker, but we're always looking at pronunciation, particularly because part of the work we do as iwi radio or tribal radio or tribal broadcasters or part of an organization that belongs within a, uh, with a tribal group, um, and now we're doing data science, now we're doing um, uh, a natural language processing, now we're doing all these uh, fun things. We know that behind all of that, we have a role to break down stereotypes. And so we have to ensure that things are led by our, uh, 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 those that represent our communities because it's really important for people to see themselves in tribal group um, that um, uh, that that we're doing 
Uh, one of the things I would add is like, for example, with pronunciation, you know, um, my father's name was Moana Roa, but then when he went to school, his name was Munro because they can't pronounce the name. But when they change the name, what they're actually telling the child is your real name isn't good enough. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like, we're also mindful um, that pronunciation is really important to, uh, well, when someone makes an effort to pronounce some, uh, um, a Maori word properly, it suggests that they have respect for the culture. And if they have respect for the culture, then they'll have respect for the people. Mm -hmm. And so we know that institutionalized racism is, uh, 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 is something that many of our people still experience today, uh, whether that's in housing, whether that's in applying um, for a job, whether that's um, uh, where they might be located in a particular place in Aotearoa and so we're also mindful about those things in the work that we do so it's kind of like a moving feast in some ways and and knowing when to pick something up and and put something down mm -hmm. understood have another question uh from the audience um the question is uh is it possible to build a corpus that's not just language uh I know Peter you talked about the importance of of dance for instance have you ever thought about maybe uh, digitizing other things that are not just language, building a corpus and being able to maybe structure or teach models about these types of things for preservation purposes? Well, we've thought about it, but we've also we've also thought, well, we need to stick to our knitting. And, um, you know, so when we do think about things, we think, OK, well, perhaps someone else is better placed to do that specific thing. Um, we do capture a lot of dance and Keone will be able to speak to that and we often think uh, um, about uh, how important it is movement and how movement tells a story and is a language of its own as well but that's not something that we have been looking at um, as a focus at this stage we've just been focusing on that language processing not saying that it's not important but um i think we've got enough on our to-do list keone you might want to chime in there yeah i mean just the with video you know we do a lot of video as well so um there's that uh, i guess that type of data video data um that we haven't we've sort of talked about um you know some of the cool things we could do um <coughs> excuse me pete mentioned um these kapahaka performances um, and speech competition. So these are like brutal three long days of like live streaming 12 hours. And I mean, you think this is hard. What is it? One and a half hours or whatever. Try live streaming for 12 hours, like three days in a row. That's what we, you know, that's our service to the community to provide access to those speeches. Um, so, you know, you're talking about a hundred like on-demand videos to cut up and, you know, write things for and upload. So we sort of think, can we, uh, you know, just train some machines to do it for us? So we make our job easier on the day because there's other things to do during a live stream besides just on-demand content. So um, right. it's something we've thought about. We just haven't. Um, yeah, you, you, you have enough on your plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So another question is, um, so you talked a lot about the, the trust of the community as being a part and the trust in the in involvement of the community, but at the outset of the project, was there ever any skepticism about this? Because you guys talked about kind of, there is somewhat of a digital divide. There may be people in your community that don't, they're not, they're just not uh, familiar with technology or these types of technologies. Has there ever been any sort of pushback or um, skepticism? Well, I think that at the beginning, people were surprised at how ambitious our goals were. Um, and people didn't believe that we would be able to bring together the data required to um, really move things along. And, uh, and I think that's because they, they thought that they could come into our community and do it for us. Um, and I think that was the difference is um, the skepticism didn't come from within our community. It came from outside of our community. Um, and uh, we were encouraged 
by our elders. Um, they built our confidence in a lot of ways. And I would like to acknowledge all the kura kaupapa or all the um, total immersion Māori language schools that have also been part of um, our um, broadcasting um, ambitions and our programs and things like that because all of those experiences have taught our team things and um, or, or it really has been um, a massive community effort. We have people that are working on the project sort of every day but then there are different layers um, uh, 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 of the project and every time you peel something off you go oh wow that's something new but there's so much to it but I can't say that we've ever had any uh, negativity as such um, we, we've received a lot of support and support that we're very respectful of excellent uh, speaking I just wanted ahead. to add I just sure. wanted to add to that I mean like because you asked before about the 30 years I mean like take who has been building trust in the community for 30 years and, and I think that's why when we set out to do the Court of the Māori project, the Corpus Gathering, there was, a, yeah, I, I can't think of, um, we made a few mistakes doing other things, um, but there was no one saying like, we shouldn't be doing this. We had we had really good support from the community. Hence, mm -hmm. hence our ability to get, we had 2,500 people sign up and contribute audio in the course of 10 days, like, which is, which is pretty amazing. And, and that just shows yeah, I, you know, shows that the trust that we that the organization has built in those 30 years. And I mean, I've only been in the organization for uh, I don't know, six years, seven years, something like that. Um, um, but, you know, it's important to remember that doing the wrong thing can take one minute um, and it can destroy that trust, all of that trust. So that's that's why we're very cognizant about, um, you know, how we look after data and, and, and how we make decisions and ensuring we're always doing the right thing or the best that we know that we can do. Yeah, it, it seems like a project that like this can't be done by anyone who's not deeply involved with the community for multiple reasons. And when you talk about data sovereignty, I wanted to ask um, on a practical level beyond just kind of being sensitive to all of these things. Um, technically, obviously, online services are owned by you know larger companies. Are there specific things that you do on a technical level to ensure that all of this is uh, taken care of in, in a, the, the right way, let's say? Well, we've got our ambitions and then we've got to manage our expectations from our community. And then we've got to deal with reality as well. And so we have um, different layers to our approach um, and managing expectations is probably the hardest, um, whether that's people being scared. And this is kind of related to your last question as well, because there's only so much that we can do at any one given moment. And sometimes we have to um, work with the repositories, work with the, the um, storage facilities, work with the resources and the tools that we have at our hands. And so it becomes a process of how we apply our principles and how we apply our values, um, because we're not going to solve everything in a week. We might not solve it in a year, but um, we certainly are mindful that um, we have to sort of fit into the bigger picture as well. And Keone's done a lot of thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like we use AWS, right? And that's, you know, for us here in New Zealand, their, their servers are in Sydney. So there is, you know, some issue around, you know, the data not necessarily being in Aotearoa or New Zealand. Um, and initially we did that because you know, S3 was cheaper than the equivalent uh, that you could buy in New Zealand. Um, and we're a, you know, small nonprofit under resource. So, um, but, but we, you know, we're still very much in control or have the sovereignty of the data and look after it. So yeah, it's, it's very much like applying those values to our processes. So like the Rongo app, um, you know, if you read through the privacy, the Kaitiaki Tanga license, that just highlights the way in which we operate, uh, a way in which we can ensure uh, Maori data sovereignty whilst, you know, launching an app like Rongo. So um, we don't just take your, uh, we don't, we, you know, all the inference is done on device. So you don't have to give us any data. Mm -hmm. um, but if you decide and we ask you 
to share your data with us. We don't, you know, and you, you don't opt out, you opt in, right? Like right. little things like that, that I think, you know, the rest of um, sort of the digital industries are kind of, you know, learning after they, you know, did it the other way around before, but we, we can't do it the wrong way first. We have to do it the right way first. Um, right. You, you, you may have saw in the funny quote, it'll app the, the screenshot in the middle um, is the first thing you see when you open up the app and it's just reiterating the Kaitiaki Tanga license or, uh, you know, the values that we're, that we expect you to, to bring with you when you use, when you use our app. So, so it's things like that, um, that help us to uh, practice the Kaitiaki Tanga um, the best that we can, given the resources that we have and the technologies that are available today. That's yeah, great. It seems like you guys have also kind of built a template that could be used for other indigenous communities across the world who, who might be doing projects like these. Do you know of any other communities that are actively engaged in these types of uh, technical techno projects for revitalization and uh, preservation purposes? We do, and we, we, we're in contact with others. We're approached by others. We always welcome the opportunity um, to work with others. And, and the wonderful thing about working with other Indigenous people is there's a whole lot that you don't have to explain. Um, you just get a lot of things. And, and so we kind of get down to work quite quickly. Um, we obviously have um, protocols and, and, and ways of engaging with one another that are quite different to the ordinary um, Western ways of business um, engagement. But we take pride in the way that we engage with, uh, with one another at that level. And uh, we've been invited uh, to participate in, in workshops and conferences and different, um, different territories. And likewise, we always take the opportunity to invite people to participate in our space. Um, we, we, we're also uh, mindful that everyone's context is different. And people experience um, different levels of language decline, uh, different levels of cultural decline as a result of uh, colonization. And so everyone's circumstances are quite different. So mm. we mind that people need to start where they are and they need to do what they can because it's not just about teaching the computer to speak our language. It's not just about machine learning. It's about the survival uh, and the future of our culture and our language for, for our future generations. And, and that's the AI for good for, for us, you know, like that's the AI for good for us. It's about, um, it's about also creating economic opportunity because if someone's going to get paid, we want it to be our crowd because um, we want to create jobs and we want to um, create pathways because we can't fix everything on our own but we know that we can be part of an educational pathway. We can be part of a development pathway. We can be part of um, an, an AI for good pathway, but we, we know that we need to have friends and we need to be part of the network that is going to help realize those aspirations. Great. Just uh, uh, one of a final question. I wanted to ask you, um, Kuni, you and I were talking a little bit about the involvement of New Zealand and kind of supporting the Maori language. Um, could you maybe elaborate on what impact that might have had and if there are any lessons to be learned from that, maybe with other governments supporting Indigenous culture and languages? I think I think Pete's probably better to answer that one. And so, I, so Pete, um, you know, just the fact that there's legislation, right, to, to have a million speakers um, by 2040 and, um, you know, what that all means. And, and you there's, know. A, there's, a, there's a goal, not so much legislation, Sorry, but right. <laughs> the government has an ambitious not goal yet. of um, seeing um, one million Maori language speakers by 2040. Um, I think we've got a very unique circumstance here in that we have Te Tiriti o Waitangi, um, and that's an agreement between um, Māori um, or the native peoples and um, the British Crown, and that was signed in 1840. Uh, but realising that in the modern context has um, uh, provided us with a platform to have some conversations and negotiations around 
how we see our rights and interests recognized. And these, and it's a critical part of our development as Indigenous people. I think that each, um, each time we make uh, some movement forward, we realize that there's still a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and, and we're also mindful that we're never going to see all our um, rights and interests recognized, but um, uh, that's just the, the way it is when, when you're a minority in your own country um, and, and the dominant um, culture and dominant language is that of um, those people that uh, have been part of the colonization process. Uh, that's just my perspective, but we have seen uh, the development of um, kura kaupapa. We've seen our language recognized as an official language. We've seen a television station um, uh, uh, and, and 21 iwi radio stations um, broadcasting the language, which plays a really important role in, 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 um, in celebrating the language, but also including all members of the community uh, in so much as the opportunity is there to consume content that's um, about Māori experiences. Excellent. Um, a question about, we've been talking a lot about um, biases and uh, the the necessity, let's say, of having someone who has skin in the game in terms of building the models and building the technology for, for preserving these types of languages. And I wondered if, for instance, when we talk about bias, you were talking about the, the Google Translate example. Is there an incentive, you think, to maybe get the community involved in correcting this type of bias? Because as you mentioned before, uh, tech companies aren't incentivized to necessarily correct things that are built into to their models, right? And here we talk a lot about, about you know, AI ethics and AI ethics is a hot topic right now. Do you think there's an incentive to maybe go to them and, and help them do right, let's say, by the community and by, by the culture? I don't, I don't know, because it's kind of like, I, I believe with Google Translate and some of these other tools, you can sort of correct them, right? Um, and so it, it's kind of, it's sort of like the Wikipedia model, except Wikipedia is actually a nonprofit, right? Um, and they seek donations, whereas Google is not a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and it kind of, this kind of then falls into the whole thing where you've got like the open source community and, you know, uh, big tech benefiting from open source and not necessarily contributing back um, to it. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, I don't, I mean, what is the incentive for us, right? Um, is right. the incentive that, um, you know, Google is going to do it right? And, and do we care? Like, do I care that Twitter has puny code for our domain? Well, I kind of do. But at the end of the day, do you know what, that's Twitter. And Twitter is very much, um, you know, a Western space. Um, yeah, we're there. Hawaiians are there. Maori are there. And, and we use it as we do. But um, we can't ever expect it to be an indigenous space because it's not even, you know, an in, you know, it's not an indigenous platform. It never will be an indigenous platform or indigenous company. So, and that's fine. Um, and so, I mean, I personally would rather see um, us creating our own digital spaces where we can have things properly spelt with the diacritics of our language, um, you know, where we won't have uh, racist things in videos of like, you know, mass murders and things like that. Um, and then, you know, so we can have a digital space for, you know, for those things that we want to do with our people and our culture. And, and we can go to other digital spaces and have all sorts of digital spaces to, to access these other things. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't, if there is an incentive, I certainly um, don't see it. And that's why, I, that's why I'm like, Google doesn't, Google Docs doesn't think our URL is real. It's like, okay, fine, whatever's. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I, would just, I would just add that we also have a, a large workforce of Māori language translators, and I'm also mindful that that that, that they're um that they're part of the Māori economy, and so like we don't want to create a situation where we're putting people out of work just because um we've managed to uh, perfect uh, translation. Uh, service for Google. Um, okay. We want to create jobs and, um, and and things for our people, and and those people are already in jobs, and and we want to maintain the integrity 
of translation. Um, and, 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 and I think that's, a, that's an important part of what we, what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And kind of speaking to that, I have uh, another question from the audience is how do you weigh the risk and reward uh, paradigm, I guess is what they mean, uh, between putting things out there online and keeping them off of just basic open access to the world? Well, there's some yeah, things that we don't have public and there's some things that we do have public. So we have a private area and we have um, an area that is for the public. Um, and there are some things that are just not fit for consumption. We might only just broadcast it once and then it stays, um, uh, it stays, I guess, private until <coughs> we decide um, that it's the right time to uh, reshare something or to to make it accessible and those and there's generally cultural reasons for that and um, that are based around perhaps some of our beliefs or or something like that and so we we do manage that and it's something that we manage carefully but that's just one example for example mm. tangihanga. we wouldn't rebroadcast tangihanga in terms of, um, you know, sometimes we do have some open source repositories. So we do uh, make a conscious decision in terms of whether we do open source uh, some of the Maori language tools that, we're, that we build. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so we have to make that sort of risk versus reward um, sort of a call where we're really, for us, it's, you know, it's whether, you know, obviously there's benefit um, with putting these um, language tools in, in the open space. Um, but for, you know, if we were to just put our whole speech engine, um, you know, in the open domain, I think the risks with that is, um, you know, anyone could sort of take it and like non Maori, uh, uh, could take it and, and profit from it, um, or, or use it for, uh, surveillance as well. Um, and so, yeah, so we, that's like, how do we do it? I, I don't know. I, we just, you know, we have a, we, we do it like, you know, Pete will do it. I'll do it. The other people in our team who will do it. I think it's, you know, our, 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 our just our background and, you know, growing up in indigenous spaces, um, you know, helps um, some of our experience and Pete works on a uh, number of boards. So it helps us in making the decision. So, so, we, and we talk, we talk about it to each other. So we do have some like internal kaitiakitanga framework that is processing in our heads. Um, when we decide like, you know, what to open source, I want not to, how to look after data and all these sorts of things. And um, yeah, I, I can't say we could necessarily codify all of it, but you know, the Kaitiakitanga license is, is our attempt to try and capture um, some of those things and expose them. Mm -hmm. And the license is really just documenting how we've worked as Iwi Radio over the last 30 years. So we've always been doing this, and um, when somebody starts with us, we have an in, we have a we have an intergenerational team. The oldest member in our uh, in our team is eighty, and the youngest one is um, in their teenagers. You know what I mean? So like in between that and that, we have a lot of um, life experience and different life experience. So there's always somebody to have a conversation with and so everything in our culture is about the porero it's about having that discussion having that debate and um coming to a consensus on things where possible but there are times of course where um we just need to make a decision and we just lean um on on our our principles and values to guide us in those decisions, particularly because when you're dealing with 30 years of trust and accountability, you can't get it wrong. And right. so we, we lean towards um, being conservative in some ways, but Maori conservative is quite different to Western conservative. You know, we have different um, manners, we have different ways of being courteous, and when it comes to making decisions, we have a different way of discussing and, and making those decisions as well. And I always like to explain that, you know, like 
being polite in the Western way is not always being polite in the Maori way. So we have a, a different way a, a, of doing things. So it's more of a conversation. It's not something that you codify. It's something that I assume that you talk about within your community. What would be acceptable? What would cause fear or what could be something that, that would expose the community, right? It's, it's kind of a moving, moving target, let's say. Okay, very good. Good, good. Um, I wanted to ask you also, um, in terms of indigenous tech, like what other projects are you seeing that are coming out of indigenous communities that might either complement what you're working on or could be interesting in terms of kind of advancing uh, goals for, for the preservation of, of culture, indigenous cultures? One of the things that we're seeing is Maramataka Māori or the Māori moon calendar and how that affects um, people's lives, people's emotions, people's moods, and um, also reviving uh, different activities associated with different um, uh, different parts of that calendar. Because Westerners have days, Māori people have nights. So it's, it is very different. It's a different way of seeing the world. That's one example. Another example that's perhaps shared um, uh, across the Pacific is the revival of um, star navigation. And um, Nainua Thompson from Hawaii and one of our revered elders, um, Hekenuku Mai Puhipi, uh, worked very, very closely uh, in um, the, the renaissance of the waka building movement or the canoe building movement, along with the people from, the, uh, from Micronesia, um, where the Kaumatua Mau um, uh, taught them how to, um, how to read the stars again, because those were uh, things that had been lost to our people. Those are two examples that I can think Very of. Very interesting examples. I wanted to ask you, um, what is left to be done? What do you think is left to be done? It seems like you've accomplished quite a lot in, in a very short amount of time. It seems like technology has gotten you uh, to places very recently that maybe 30 years ago, the community had never dreamed about. But what, what are you still, what's still left for you guys to achieve um, what is missing and how could this community, the AI for Good community, how could the community at large help? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I sort of mentioned it before, you know, we still need to build bilingual tools. And I think everything that we've met, uh, mentioned, except maybe the pronunciation model needs to, needs to be bilingual if we want it to be practical. You know, you can imagine like using speech just in your day to day, whether it's with Siri, whether it's public transport, you know, in your car, um, it absolutely has to be bilingual. So that's like a key focus for us um, moving forward. You know, the aspirations with pronunciation, we wanna bring back the native sound that was lost. And, and you know, we wanna do this uh, for Te Reo Māori. I wanna see it happen for Olelo Hawaii, you know, I'm, me being Hawaiian. So um, we are, you know, we've started uh, um, some projects with, uh, Hawaii and hope to see the same sort of uh, things you're seeing coming out for Te Reo Māori for uh, Olelo Hawaii um, and, and possibly other Pacific languages if, you know, if those communities uh, want that, because it's not, you know, it's not for uh, us to decide for other Pacific people what they, you know, should or shouldn't do with their language. We just want to, um, you know, support them if we can or, or um, yeah, work with them um, if, if, you know, if that's the right way forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, thinking way, way, way beyond, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, we just, you know, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we need to ensure that our indigenous ways, our languages, our cultures are going to exist into the future. Um, and so whatever that future might be in, in light of AI and all these things, you know, we just have to keep on doing, uh, what we're doing. Um, and ensure we're not just, you know, dominated by something else. I, I was thinking how, like, you know, there's these large language models as if there's only going to be one, one model, right? Or one right. AI trained off of all the data. I mean, like, where in, where in this planet 
do we see that working right where there's one organism that just dominates them all i mean i mean you might have cycles of that and then they eventually run out of food and then they die off in the other organisms i mean what we see is diversity right we see a right. lot of ecosystems and diversity and, and evolution and, it's yeah, and yeah evolution yeah everything's sort of operating you know in this yeah, things building balance. on top of each other exactly exactly absolutely no. And you guys have so, accomplished so much already. <laughs> you don't necessarily need to, to look into new goals because you're already accomplishing so much. And, and I am totally inspired. I think all of our audience will, will be we, by, by what you've done already. I mean, you mentioned, you know, an ask. I mean, we're always looking for funding. So any funding opportunities out there, philanthropy, you know, what have you, we're, yeah, we're always, um, you know, looking to grow what, what we've started. Um, yeah, just to scale, scale what we're doing because we all could use more sleep too. <laughs> hard work we, all right we really want to be able to grow our team and we're mindful that um that resources is what helps make that happen i mean in maori we have a proverb that's very well known and it says kua roa to tatu haere kia kaua e haere tonu he nui ngā mahi kua mahia kia kaua e mahi tonu We've come too far not to go further and we've done too much not to do more. So we're always thinking about what we have to do, which is more and more because we're trying to, we're, we're trying to uh, battle against time. We're battling against time. Um, our people die younger, 10 years younger than the Westerner. Um, the average age of a, a native speaker of our language is 55 years old and older. That's the, most of our uh, native speakers. Every time we lose a word in our language, we lose part of our culture. Every time we lose a native speaker, we lose a repository of language and culture that we can't get back. Mm -hmm. So we're mindful of all that. And we're also mindful that language um, comes from the landscape and the environment that it belongs in. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're very mindful that our people that are at home are a resource, they're a living resource. So if anything, if there's anything we need to do more of, it's more with the people that speak our language so that when we do uh, achieve more with our artificial intelligence um, efforts, it reflects uh, the reality that comes out of the mouths of our people when they speak. And so it's very important to us. Okay, that's an excellent way to close. Thank you so much, Keone and Peter, very inspiring. Uh, we still have a little bit of time for networking. So if you could just stay on the line uh, in case anyone would like to ask some extra questions. Thank you so much. Kia ora, aloha. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.